Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this online community conversation. I'm James Duparbieri, uh, Associate Program Director of the Forest Center, and I'll be your host for today. So any problems that you have, technical or not, feel free to just drop me a message in the chat and I'll try to help you. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to very quickly go through a couple of Zoom rules for this call. Uh, first of all, if you could all please mute yourselves during the presentation and during the Q&A, unless you're called upon, uh, that'll be fantastic as that will ensure a good quality audio. But at the same time, I encourage all to uh, turn on your cameras uh, to see everyone's faces and reactions. Um, during the Q&A discussion, if you want to ask a question, you can use the raise your hand function on Zoom, which is found in the reactions at the bottom of your screen. Otherwise, if you physically raise your hand and if I spot you, I'll call you out and you can ask your question. Um, this session is recorded for archival purposes and for you all. This is a free event, so this will be uploaded to YouTube uh, on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. So you should either receive a link or um, see the not notification if you're a subscriber. Um, so yes, now we can start this session and let me just start by introducing our speaker, Christopher Hawk. Uh, Chris Hi. is a regular presenter here at the Party Center. Uh, he's a Jungian analyst in the private practice and a senior lecturer emeritus at Goldsmith, uh, University of London, uh, who's interested in the applications of depth psychology to a wide range of social and cultural phenomena, including film. Chris has written several books on this topic and has even directed a few short films. Uh, so today, Chris will be discussing the screen and the soul, virtual reality, real reality, and how it is. So mostly due to COVID, the Pari Center, together with so many organizations, have been forced to move online, which, you know, through Teams or Zoom, which on one side has been fantastic because we've been able to reach cross continents, being able to approach people that we weren't able to approach before. And for us, at least, it really helped grow our community. But why do so many people still find that the virtual meetings are lesser than a real life in-person event? Why are we all now, after a whole year of this, are starting to get the Zoom fatigue? Maybe how we think about virtual reality and real reality is wrong. Maybe we need to start thinking about reality, how it is in a different way. So Chris will talk just about this. So let's discuss about virtual environments in a virtual environment. Over to you, Chris. Thanks, James. That's brilliant. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I originally conceived of this as a um, as, as something to talk to therapists about. And so, you know, it has got that theme to start with. But of course, um, the COVID pandemic has required us to keep a broader social distance from one another and where possible to work from home. Um, and for psychotherapists, of course, this should be less of a problem. Um, after all, many of us have already been working from a home consulting room, uh, while others have an office elsewhere sealed off to ensure privacy. And psychotherapists tend to avoid um, the norms of social contact and aim to keep a greater distance from clients than you'd find in other social settings. Um, but it seems that taking up an alternative to meeting clients in person, you know, using online things like this, like Zoom, um, hasn't been an easy transition for all psychotherapists to make. And this is where I've got to say that, you know, many other people working in person in offices or all sorts of encounters, well, most jobs involve working with other people um, have found it hard to switch to Zoom and find something equivalent in their, uh, in, in, in their job satisfaction or their job effectiveness. But, you know, particularly psychotherapists, some of them, not all of them, have, uh, have struggled with this, as have some clients. Many therapists and clients feel they miss something about being in the bodily presence of the other. Um, maybe they miss the nuance of a, of a body movement or glimpse of a facial in, expression that's communicating something not easily visible without the whole person in front of you. Um, now, with reliable broadband, making a session online as clear and uninterrupted as if you were together in a consulting room, why do so many people still find the online session falls so far short of meeting in person? Well, many would say um, it's because one is real, and I'm going to do this a lot, but I'll do it with my voice. This is, this is my quotes voice, real, like that, 
Okay. Um, one is real and the other is an electronic screened version of the session and by, by implication, not as real. I have to add the as because a computer screen and audio speakers are as solid, material and real as a person in front of us. And the image and voice of the person on the screen is an accurate version of the reality it has mediated and delivered to us through the software and broadband uh, into the computer itself. Our senses are responding in exactly the same way to the audio signal and the screen image as our eyes and ears would respond to the sight and voice of the person in front of us. But despite this, psychotherapy sessions experienced as a person-to-person -person physical and embodied encounter in a three-dimensional space, um, oh, I've gone ahead a bit, is thought to be and felt to be very different to the exact same psychotherapy session experienced between two people mediated by a computer screen and software. Now, if we class the first, the in-person, as reality, we need to call the second, the computer version of our meeting, virtual reality. Now, what do we mean by the word virtual when pairing it with reality? Well, surprisingly, the word virtual has had the meaning of being something in essence or effect, though not actually or in fact, since the mid 1400s. And the term virtual has been used in the computer sense of not physically existing, but made to appear by software since about 1959. In discussing the difference between the two types of sessions so far, I've been broadly in line with that second definition. The software allows the client and the session to appear to our senses when it's not physically in front of us. I'm just going to clear up my screen here. That's it. The first and older definition is more interesting, isn't it? Although the person and session is not present actually or in fact, what is present is something in essence or effect. Now, given that most of us have switched to working in this way, and by and large are still delivering effective psychotherapy, and the rest of you, you're delivering effective work, whatever you do, using Zoom and so on when you have to. The question arises, how can this virtual version possibly work? How come an activity, this is the therapy, belonging to the field of personal human relations, specializing in the emotional, psychological and symbolic understanding between two people and the internal understanding that accompanies this? How can this be conducted in any equivalent way if the two people don't physically encounter one another and have a dialogue for 50 minutes in the same space. Is the virtually real as good a version as the real one? If not, and it is less good, in what way is it inferior and why? If the virtual version is as good and maybe sometimes better than the real conditions, why might that be? Psychotherapists and everyone else, I'm sure, are keen to banter this question around and find all sorts of reasons for one side or the other, with the gold medal usually going to the real in-person situation. But maybe we're asking a redundant question. Maybe our assumption that there is a real version and that there is a virtual version let alone that one's better than the other, is wrong to begin with. I'd like to lay out three approaches to this question, and this will be the talk, really. These go broadly beyond the rather parochial arguments about what's needed for a psychotherapy session to work, but they will still have a certain bearing on how online work is seen. In fact, I hope my approaches, both from our field the psychotherapy field, my field, and outside it will offer a helpful perspective. Right, the first derives from the philosophical implications arising from quantum physics and other fields as analyzed by David Deutsch in his book, The Fabric of Reality. The second approach 
digs further into philosophical implications around the nature of what is real and discusses the idea that material reality is not an objective fact, but is only known through being rendered in consciousness and therefore consciousness is all there is. This is known as metaphysical idealism. Here, I rely mainly on Bernardo Castrop's work. Remember him from the very first talk uh, on our consciousness series? Bernardo Castrop's work, especially his understanding of both Schopenhauer's The World as Will and Representation, and also his understanding of Jung's metaphysics. Lastly, my third point, when involved in our virtual session, we need to remember we are watching a screen and listening to those appearing on it in front of us. Of course, this is what we do when we watch a film or a documentary, which have long been delivering a reality to us in this form. And yet no one's saying we should abandon this activity and seek out the real version as the only authentic one. No, far from it. We enjoy immersing ourselves in these virtual realities of film. And so I'll finish with discussing the bioevolutionary ideas around visual perception, meaning, and something called affordance in relation to the film experience. And in doing so, I'll bring us back to that definition of virtual, which flagged it as something in essence or effect. This may put the idea of the real reality and the virtual reality in a new perspective. So we're starting with the idea that the in-person session for a psychotherapist or meeting where our senses experience another person directly is actually real, while the session experienced through software and a computer screen like this is not real or is at least not as real. The judgment requires us, of course, then to have a criteria for reality. Now, in his book, The Fabric of Reality, David Deutsch, a researcher in quantum computing, recalls an episode in Boswell's Life of Johnson, where Boswell and Johnson, Dr. Johnson, are discussing Bishop Barclay's solipsistic theory of the non-existence of the material world. Kicking a large stone with his foot, Johnson says, as his foot rebounded, I refute it thus. Dr. Johnson's point was that Barclay's denial of the rock's existence is incompatible with finding an explanation of the rebound that he himself felt. From this, Deutsch establishes his first criteria for reality. Namely, if something can kick back, it exists. Moreover, it's not hard, how hard something kicks back that makes the theory of its existence compelling. What matters is its role in the explanations that such a theory provides. This is David Deutsch. Dr. Johnson's criterion tells us to regard as real those complex entities which, if we did not regard them as real, would complicate our explanations. And then he gives this analogy. For instance, we must regard the planets as real because if we didn't, we'd be forced into complicated explanations of a cosmic planetarium or of altered laws of physics um, or of angels. In fact, anything that would give us the illusion that there are planets up there in space. And this leads Deutsch to his next level of criterion for reality. If, according to the simplest explanation, an entity is complex and autonomous, then that entity is real. Deutsch then discusses the computer and so-called virtual reality with these criteria in mind. He introduces us to the idea of complexity in computing, which asserts that the more complex an operation, the more is required in computing power, storage, memory, length of program, and so on. 
Turning again to the planets, it's a good analogy, and the idea of a planetarium created by complex computing power, accurately controlling the projectors that makes you see the stars above you. Deutsch says this, to do this authentically, the computer has to use the formulae provided by astronomical theories. In fact, the computation that's showing you the planetarium is identical to one that it would perform if it were calculating predictions of where an observatory should point its telescopes to see real planets and stars. Those two computations, one describing the night sky, the other describing the planetarium, are largely identical. This leads to the third criterion for reality. Here we are. If a substantial amount of computation would be required to give us the illusion that a certain entity is real, then that entity is real. Okay. If at this point you want to object that computers and their activities are all human made and of a human design, and as such do not appear in nature without a human being conceiving them, inventing them and making them, you'd be right. But Deutsch points out a very important way of seeing that begins to bridge what is natural and real and what is human made or artificial and only real in a certain way. Bear in mind, we're fumbling around with the idea that our psychotherapy session in person is radically different more natural, more real, compared to the psychotherapy session online, mediated through a computer screen, like we're doing now. What Deutsch points out is that some parts of physical reality, such as symbols, pictures, or human thoughts, resemble other parts. The resemblance may be concrete, as when images in a planetarium resemble the night sky. but they may also be abstract. He says there are mathematical symbols in physical reality. The fact it, that it is us, we who put them there, doesn't make them any less physical. In those symbols, in our planetariums, books, films, and computer memories, and in our brains, there are images of physical reality at large. Images not just of the appearance of objects, but of the structure of reality. To the extent that these symbols, images, and theories are true, their existence gives reality a new sort of self-similarity. The self-similarity we call knowledge. This is a key phrase of his. The fact that virtual reality is possible is an important fact about the fabric of reality. Deutsch summarizes that computers are physical entity, entities and they can compute the behavior of interesting physical and abstract entities and as such are part of the self-similarity of physical reality. He says, any virtual reality generator must be able to manipulate our senses, overriding their normal function so that we can experience the specified environment instead of the actual one. So when we look at the screen, like we are now, or in therapy in our online session, we need to feel we are looking at the other person and not just at a rectangle of glass with an image on it, and maybe some MacBook icons along the bottom. But Deutsch points out that none of this is new. And all techniques of representational art and long distance communication may be thought of as overriding the normal functioning of the senses. Well, movies, which I come to later, certainly do. 
but Deutsch points out how ancient forms such as cave paintings are also depicting events, creatures and activities that are not happening in front of the viewer now. This is from uh, the Hopi down there in Arizona. Because they're looking at a cave wall, it's not happening now, but they depict a reality of another time and place that is relevant and interesting, especially to those hunters nearer the time. These days, the term virtual reality is reserved for apparatus which is impacting a good range of the user's senses and which are, above all offers interaction, a kicking back between the user and the simulated environment or entities. Now, this is sounding much more like our online work in that psychotherapy sessions definitely offer a kickback. I was talking with colleagues just earlier this afternoon about how the responses between a, a client and a therapist and what they notice and what they say to each other and what they feel about each other are just as present and kicking back at each other as if they were in the room. Deutsch's main example though, and this is the one we will know about amongst others, his main example of virtual reality is that of the flight simulator. And good old Bernardo, this is why I was delighted that Bernardo came up with this uh, idea of the array of, of, uh, of the flight simulator and the, the cockpit array, which isn't real, as a, a, an analogy, one of his many analogies for you know, what is consciousness and what is reality. But Deutsch's main example is this flight simulator used to train pilots. He says, the pilot may experience flying the aircraft through a storm and hear the thunder and see the rain driving against the windscreen, though none of these things are there in reality. What is outside the cockpit in reality is just a computer, some hydraulic jacks, television screens and loudspeakers and a perfectly dry and stationary room. So the question arises, does this invalidate Dr. Johnson's criteria for reality? Well, Deutsch says no. As the Boswell-Johnson conversation could have been held inside a flight simulator. I refute it thus, he, Johnson, might have said, opening the throttle and feeling the simulated engine kick back. There's no engine there. What kicks back is ultimately a computer running a program. But these processes in the computer itself, remember a physical object, are no less real for Dr. Johnson than the processes in a jet engine. As far as the argument against solipsism goes, it doesn't matter whether it's a real engine, it's still kicking back. After all, Deutsch says, Johnson's rock could have been a holographic image. So long as its response was complex and autonomous, Dr. Johnson would have had the right to conclude that it was caused by something real outside himself, and therefore that reality did not consist of himself alone. A virtual reality flight simulator is designed to give the user external experiences, engine kicking back, sight and sound of the rain, and so on, which can be programmed. The user will also experience internal processes, such as arousal, anxiety, tension, relief, anticipation, assumptions about the result of their actions and so on. These internal experiences, however, cannot be programmed in the same way. The programmer might anticipate some internal experiences arising as the result of what is programmed, but definite predictable internal experiences are not programmable. And after all, this is how they're going to tell the difference between someone who can fly well and someone who's still got a lot to learn by the way they're going to be reacting to the simulator and, and what it throws up for them. The comparison between virtual reality and the activity of human minds is pursued further when accuracy of a virtual reality is defined as, this is Deutsch again, the closeness as far as is perceptible of the rendered environment to the intended one. Think about the flight simulator, you know, how real is it for them? And just as accurately 
and just as accurately rendering an environment depends on the knowledge of its physics, in a reverse way, think of the planetarium and the sky again, in a reverse way, discovering the physics of an environment depends on creating a virtual reality rendering of it. However, instead of using more programming and hardware, our human minds operating in scientific ways with their own tools use our own brains to do this. The explanation of an eclipse, for example, can be printed in a book. The symbols, words, diagrams, theories evoke in the reader's mind some sort of likeness of the predicted effects of an eclipse, against which the real appearance of that effect will be tested. The likeness thus evoked is interactive in the same way as the virtual reality in that the symbols and words can be tested against sensory experience, witnessing the eclipse from many points of view and with many different tools of observation. Here is the crunch of the argument. The connection between the physical world and the worlds that are renderable in virtual reality is far closer than it looks. We think of some as depicting fact and others as depicting fiction, but the fiction is always an interpretation in the mind of the beholder. And I'll pick up on that last point when we come to think about films at the end. But for now, we need to round off the application of Deutsch's view of reality, virtual and otherwise, by thinking about the human elements back in that psychotherapy session. I ask the question again, how is it possible to conduct a psychotherapy session with no one there? How is it possible I'm giving a talk to people with no one there? I'm just looking at my garden here. There's no one there. No one except in the form of an electronic image of a person far reduced in size and witnessed through a small window, hardly bigger than a book. How do we get over the sense impressions we're receiving to render the virtual reality of a session with another human being like ourselves, and not a tiny one, one assumes. How do we do it? We do it through imagination. Not only this, but we must remember there is no direct experience of the world. Everything we witness, whether we think there's a real world out there or not, and more on that in a minute, ends up as an internal impression and internal experience. Deutsch puts it like this. Imagination is a straightforward form of virtual reality. What may not be so obvious is that our direct experience of the world through our senses is virtual reality too. Every last scrap and every last scrap of our knowledge Mathematics and philosophy and imagination and fiction and art and fantasy is encoded in the form of programs for the rendering of those worlds and our brain's own virtual reality generator. So, in our discussion of the reality value of in-person therapy versus the virtual online version, let's consider the journey so far. We've started with a definition and a criterion for reality. Follow this up with the computer generation, generated simulation of reality. And have got to a point where it seems that what we once thought of as merely virtual is not an alien reality after all. It's already a typical human reality. As a metaphysical understanding of both psyche and material realities, it sounds similar to the idea of archetypes, which we'll think about in a minute. It sounds like we have to take seriously this idealist idea or view that there is no other reality than that which consciousness is in itself. Biologically speaking, the virtual reality rendering of their environment is the characteristic means by which human beings survive. Virtual reality is not just a technology, 
in which computers simulate the behavior of physical environments is the basis of human imagination and external experiences of science and mathematics, even art, especially, and fiction. Metaphysical idealism. Is this how it is, like Bernardo Castro says? Let's approach it like this. The myth of the fall in Genesis, where Eve eats the fruit of the tree of knowledge and persuades Adam to do the same. And frankly, it could be either way around. I mean, it's all a bit sexist, isn't it? And it's generated piles of different perspectives on men and women. But frankly, it doesn't matter. We did this everyone. Um, it strikes us as a story of how human beings first came to self-consciousness. Not just consciousness, but reflective consciousness or meta-consciousness. We need to be clear about these two terms when considering an idealist metaphysical worldview, such as we find in Jung and Schopenhauer, who was quite an influence on Jung. Every animate being is conscious to some extent in that they experience. A humble fly, even a microbe, experiences their environment and responds to that experience along the lines of its instinctive behavior. The Bible story of Adam and Eve says that once they had eaten of the tree of knowledge, the fruit of the tree of knowledge, they knew they were naked. They knew they were naked before that, in that they experienced themselves as naked. They didn't name it, but they didn't reflect on it and imagine there was something else they could do, like find a fig leaf or feel less ashamed because their genitals were on show or something like that. But they did experience their nakedness. It wasn't an experience. In their original state of knowledge or no knowledge, they knew they were naked in the sense that they experienced themselves like this. They only knew they were naked in the sense of as opposed to being clothed or dressed as donkeys or anything else the reflective mind could make up after they ate of the tree of knowledge, which gave them reflective consciousness or meta-consciousness. This distinction is really important as the term consciousness is used by Jung and many others in a loose way so that meta-consciousness, the reflective awareness only humans possess, it seems, gets mixed up with consciousness as experience, knowing something is, I think as Bernardo puts it, where every, which every living thing possesses uh, to some extent. It is this consciousness as experience that is being referred to in the metaphysical discussions of reality called idealism. Idealist philosophies point out there is no guarantee a material world exists at all as such a world is only ever known through perceptual experience. With the conclusion, consciousness is all there is. Jung helps us with this way of thinking as by and large, instead of consciousness as a word, he uses the term psyche. When he does use consciousness, he tends to mean our meta or reflective consciousness. This is Jung. The only form of existence we know of immediately is psychic. We might as well say that physical existence is merely an inference, since we know of matter only insofar as we perceive psychic images transmitted by the senses. And that's Pauli next to him, and he comes in in a minute later. Two more ideas of Jung's at the basis of his psychology and worldview contribute to our understanding that we're discussing today of the relationship between material reality and psychic experience. These are, of course, synchronicity and the archetypes of the collective unconscious. Now, I think we tend to have a rather parochial view of these 
these days. And I think that's the responsibility of all the Jungian psychoanalytic trainings and the way everything has been directed towards a more medicalized, more treatment orientated way of using Jung, which was part of it, but you know, not even maybe the main thing he wanted us to notice. These days we overlook the implications of these powerful ideas, which are also empirical experiences. Synchronicity accounts for meaningful, but a-causal, without cause, links between objects and events in the so-called material world and mental events, dreams or cognitions in the human psyche. From a narrow point of view, archetypes are defined simply as part of the unconscious psyche, which acting rather like the collective DNA we now know we all have in common, uh, forms an understanding in a typical human fashion. The archetypes are regarded rather like some sort of psychic genetic inheritance that's built up over thousands of years of human beings being around. But I think such a simplified understanding falls far short of what Jung meant and what is implied by archetypes. Let's take the human mind for a second and look briefly how we operate. This is largely through cognitive associations based on similarity. This is Bernardo's way of putting across Jung's view and it's my view too. Just as we heard from David Deutsch, when discussing the levels of knowing and reality, we can experience through symbols, images, maths, as well as our senses, our minds allow for the similarity between representations in some form and the perceptual experiences delivered through the senses in that other form. You'd have no difficulty in understanding what I meant if I showed you, as I am now, a picture of a dog. This is a drawing of a dog. The image is flat, two-dimensional, visually similar, but otherwise nothing like an actual dog which in reality would be a moving three-dimensional creature, an object of our vision and other senses, smell especially. We are also afforded similarity between the picture and the three and the real dog by, and again, sorry, this is a photo now, not a drawing, but it's just as flat and two-dimensional, but you're getting the picture better. But we're afforded similarity between um, uh, the, the picture and the real dog by the word dog, the three letter word like that. And if you knew the, the, word, the French word chien, you can associate these five letters, different letters and have the same image in your imagination and the same intended meaning. And these are far distant from a real dog, far distant. They're totally unlike a real material dog, but they're also dog and chien, totally unlike each other. It's their associate, this is for Natalie, chien. It's their associated meaning that links them all together, not direct correspondence of form. Discussing this further with his own example, because this is mine, Bernardo Castro makes the same point. He brings it together like this. He says, hence what these things have in common the basis for their association is the similarity of what they evoke, not their particular form. A correspondence of meaning is just an instance of similarity so defined. Synchronicity is defined as a meaningful coincidence between an inner psychic state and an outer physical event that are similar in the broad sense just discussed. But can this be extended to the a causal coinciding of two physical events alone? Not a psychic one, mental one and a physical one, but two physical events alone. Well, it's no surprise that Jung himself extends the extension of synchronicity in this way. He says there may also possibly be, be coincidences of this kind between non-psychic events. For the connection of psychic states to each other, 
and to non-psychic events, I use the term meaning as a psychically appropriate paraphrasing of the term similarity. In the coincidence of non-psychic events, one would naturally use the latter term, similarity. Jung's work with Pauli, the theoretical physicist, physicist Wolfgang Pauli, meant that he could use the discoveries of quantum mechanics to leverage his metaphysical conclusions in an empirical fashion without being accused of any speculative philosophizing, which he felt was very out of fashion for a scientific psychologist in his day. He says, since no individual quantum event is causally determined, the implication is that all quantum events must be structured according to some global pattern of similarities. It follows from this that synchronicity, insofar as it defines the structures or tendencies underlying all quantum events, is the only metaphysically real ordering principle in nature. And I remember having discussions with David, David Pete, uh, about the importance of um, similarities and this sort of patterning, which seems to be behind things. And here we have Castro bringing it to our attention via um, Jung and, and Pauli. Um, what Jung has done is extrapolate the basis for naturally occurring cognitive associations in the psyche to a universal basis for the organization of all events in nature. This is the big picture of what archetype is. This is the big picture. And Jung himself brings together psyche and archetype into one metaphysical system of non-material idealism. When he writes, it is fundamentally impossible to prove that the law of nature is actually based on something totocolo, totally different from what in psychology we call archetype. The unavoidable conclusion, if you think this way, is that psyche is not in here, in our heads. Equally, the archetypes are not simply part of our physiology, like DNA that's manifesting through the psyche, but neither are the psyche and archetypes out there. We're seeing it all the wrong way, the wrong way round. There is no in here and out there. What we imagine to be the material world is only ever psyche. The psyche, this is Jung, is the world's pivot. Not only is it the one great condition for the existence of a world at all, it's also an intervention in the existing natural order. That really needs pondering. And no one can say with certainty where this intervention will finally end. I missed that out on the slide, but that's what he said. Jung experienced for himself, as many have, a profound sense of connection with his environment, the world apparently outside himself, the transpersonal ground beyond ourselves. He experienced it as the extension of psychic substance, linking all living beings, as well as the inanimate and inorganic world. Jung describes the collective unconscious as a boundless expanse where I experience the other in myself and the other than myself experiences me. His emphasis couldn't be clearer, look at this. No, the collective unconscious is anything but an encapsulated personal system. Is sheer objectivity as wide as the world and open to all the world. There I'm utterly one with the world, so much a part of it I forget all too easily who I really am. Lost in oneself is a good way of describing this state, but this self is the world, if only a consciousness could see it. That's why we must know who we are. That's why it comes back to some idea of his therapy treatment, because that's the root. And the point is to know this. So we're getting to the point where we need to reflect hard upon our assumption 
that the real version of events of a psychotherapy session or, or any of your work sessions or this are owned solely by the material version of two people in a three-dimensional room. There is plenty to be said for the online version and its virtual reality. There is also plenty to be said for looking into what is really happening and the meaning created and how for psyche and hence for ourselves, the material conditions are not nearly so, the so-called material conditions are not nearly so important after all. Right. Last section, and then we're done. So to finally bring this home, let's take a brief look at that other experience of reality that has been pleasing and convincing us for over a hundred years now. It's flat and odorless. It consists of light moving across a two dimensional surface while audio signals are sent to our ears. How can this seem so real? Well, film, films do seem real and they can sweep us along with an experience that um, may move and influence us, just like events in the so-called real world. Now, you recall how David Deutsch gave us the example of how virtual reality offered an experience as real as it gets in the computer-generated pilot training experience? Well, similarly, a guy called James Gibson, a young psychologist, uh, used to studying visual perception in the lab back in the day in the 50s, I think, noticed how pilots moving rapidly through the air, real pilots really flying, process visual information against a visual world rushing past a great speed. Clearly, problems of perception were subject to one's relationship to one's environment. In visual perception, the light information is always changing in what Gibson called the ambient optic array. But they are what he calls invariants that specify objects in the world which inform action or inform emotion when action is not possible as when we're watching something in the cinema. From an evolutionary point of view, landing planes and watching films is using a visual system developed in another time for other purposes, rather similar to what Deutsch said about um, cave wall paintings. Other purposes such as seeking food and avoiding danger. Put simply, the goal of a visual system is to detect light and then patterns of light. And the intention or telos of this is to extract meaning and inform action. The process must be accurate and fast enough to promote survival. Hence, in itself, visual perception need not involve higher level processes like schemas and representations and concepts. After all, flies and jellyfish can do it. We have to pose this. If the goal of the perceptual system is to inform action in the world and information is in the patterns of electromagnetic radiation, molecular disturbances in the air and the like, then it's reasonable to ask how the information which exists out there in the world comes to inform the internal actions of an organism. For Castro and Jung, the answer would be that they are of the same stuff. There's an archetypal ordering that makes the signal and the receiver, the stuff being perceived and the stuff doing the perceiving, all the same stuff, all a psyche. Going back to this fellow Gibson, he offers a meta theory of perception consistent with what we know of biological evolution. But he also offers us the vital concept of affordance, which connects the perception of objects with their meaning. The affordances of an environment are what it offers the animal. It implies the complementarity of animal and environment. 
For example, the ground affords walking on, an overhanging ledge affords shelter, and an apple object affords something to eat. No higher level of meaning is required. Affordance is defining meaning as a relationship between the perceiver and the object of perception. This is very similar to what Daniel Hoffman, I've got his book over there, says about, you know, fitness overrides truth and accuracy of perception. Fitness and us needing it, that is how we've evolved. In other words, whether we are encountering something we regard as real reality, with two people experiencing being in a room together doing therapy, or whether this is mediated through a computer screen and audio, our perceptual system delivers meaning before and in spite of any higher level cognition taking place. Just as it does when we're convinced of the meaning we experience watching a film screen. So, just to finish, in The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy's dog Toto pulls back the curtain to reveal what's behind the whole world she's been experiencing. It's an old man pulling the levers. Looks a bit like Jung, doesn't he? From behind. I started with the presenting problem of how some find the use of screen and computer technology less real than the real thing of two people meeting in a room for a therapy session or the real thing of meeting in an office or the real thing of meeting in a, in a committee room and so on. This led me to consider um, David Deutsch's views on how our direct experience of the world uh, through the senses is virtual reality too. And the fact that we live in a world where virtual reality is possible is an important fact about the fabric of reality itself. This led me on to the metaphysics bit and the true nature of things as implied in Jung's ideas and Bernardo Kastrup's metaphysical idealism. And I brought up the idea that psyche and the archetypes of the collective unconscious are neither in our minds or out there in the world. They are all there is or a way of talking about all there is, and in themselves beyond any knowing apart from that small part we can know using the perceptual apparatus that we have. The whole distinction between material reality and the perception of reality in a sentient creature's mind is a falsehood and at best a necessary illusion by which psyche or the will or God, if you like, might know itself. Of course, it also stops us bumping into the furniture and make sure we keep breeding so we continue in the Darwin inversion, which is true too. Lastly, we considered how the artifact of film, an earlier virtual reality, if you like, is so convincing. And thinking about this leads us back to thinking about how reality itself can be so convincing and how meaning, which arises from perceiving, might be understood. The meaning that arises within the psychotherapy session in person or one conducted online is not dependent on the material form or content in which the session is conducted. It strikes me that meaning is what counts when it comes to what is real and meaning will transcend the conditions or contexts within which it arises. Thank you for listening. Thank you mm. so much, Chris. What an incredibly interesting presentation you've just given there. Um, yeah, there's definitely lots to think about. Um, you know, my, I guess the, the relationship that I have with virtual reality, the closest relationship I have is probably through immersive virtual reality if we're calling it that you know the helmet that you put on and you're in a 3d world that you can interact with so at the same time also video games video games is another form of virtual reality highly interactive one that even in some ways it kicks you back 
you know, at the mm. moment they're, they're just rolling out the suits that you can put on while playing virtual reality. So when something kicks you, you're going to feel it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that is that is just another, you know, th this conversation that we're having now is something that I feel will be a very prevalent conversation in the near future, especially with these rollouts of new virtual reality systems. And the line of reality will become even more blurred. You know, mm -hmm. it, especially during COVID, you know, I've been, I bought the virtual reality headset because of COVID. <laughs> so I can, you know, be with people online, move around, high five people, even though they're not really there. So it's definitely, it's definitely a conversation that it will come up more often. So thank you for your great presentation, Chris. Um, well, it's interesting how these conditions of, of COVID and lockdown and being separate and keeping distance have not only stimulated this paper, but have stimulated more thinking about this and, and why wouldn't it, you know, and us having to accept another version of our human contact has led to, well, how, how less real or more real is this? Yeah, very interesting times. Mm. Well, then let me ask you a question, because, of course, with the question of reality comes also the question of identity. You know, I've, for example, let's take social media. Social media, you have different accounts, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And it, it, each account reflects a certain aspect of yourself. On LinkedIn, you're a bit more professional. On Instagram, you might be a bit more cooler. On Facebook, a bit more friendly. So if these virtual realities may as well be reality, what does that mean about identity? Very, very good point. A very good point. I mean, yeah, that you could have a whole other swerve into that discussion, couldn't you? you I don't know. Let me, let me think about that. Okay, no problem. Let me think about it. Very good question. Though. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Well, let's then open it up to the audience. Actually, one thing, uh, Chris, would you mind uh, stop sharing the screen so we can see everyone? Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Stop share. Okay, Great. Right. thank you. Thank you. Um, so yes, let's open it up to everyone else. As I said earlier, if you want to ask a question, use the raise your hand function uh, on Zoom or physically raise your hand and we can start. I can already see a hand up by Natalie. Hello, um, uh, Chris, thank you so much. That was so amazing. And I'm a therapist, so I totally share the view that, you know, virtual or in the room to me, it's I mean, it's been pretty amazing. I do have a question. I love when you say meaning transcends virtual or in the room. I think it's very interesting. However, I keep asking, although I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of both, I keep asking myself that what creates meaning in the room, it's also the energy between the two people, you know, that's also helps for the meaning. So how, how do you, I mean, it's very different virtually. It's this, this energy of two people in the room I don't feel it virtually, or it's a different kind of energy. Yeah, it strikes me, it throws us back on, on the fact that we are very languaged organisms. We have a very unique quality by which we are representing things to ourselves and each other through language and through this very clever system of vocal cords and enunciation. And really, if, if therapy is about anything, it's about that sort of communication and the, the sort of communication that then allows other intuitions and other energies, as you say, to almost ride upon the, 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 non, the non, yeah, ride as non-physical accompaniments to the physical audio version of ourselves and 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 the visual version, um, I I don't I haven't found in my experience that there is less of that going on if I'm not with a person in the room. If there is that languaged relationship, sometimes even when you're not even seeing someone, when you've got the video off, there is a, a way of knowing, and it really actually leads you towards thinking that we're not nearly so separate from each other as we think. And so it's not greater separation when we're not together in the room, but 
it's maybe other things and you can see how we actually are knowing each other just as well even if we're not in each other's physical presence there's a whole load of quantum stuff about that as we know entangled realities and i think we have our version of that and it's it's not necessarily needed to have a body and be with another okay, body. But chris chris concretely on um, carl young talk a lot about energy um, but concretely uh, when someone cries when i have a patient who cries I have a very different experience if I'm virtual or if I'm physically there for that person. Well, well I do, I do. And we, we talked about this a bit this afternoon. Yeah. I have an impulse to touch someone's arm or something like that if they're crying. Um, it's not what you tend to be allowed to do in therapy. It's not, it's not the sort of normal social situation. But yeah, that, that, you, you feel that tendency, but maybe that urge, that urge, even though you can't actually do the touching, even though there's no point in moving your arm, maybe that urge actually comes through. That's what I think. I think people feel it. They feel your, your compassion if that's the urge that comes but through. But I, I, as a therapist, have a harder time to, to feel or to be there when it's virtual and the person is very distressed. I, 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 it's, it's not the same experience than if I have the person in the room with me. No, I, it's no. personal. It's very different. Yeah. yeah, we are having different levels of experience about this. I know. Yeah, I think I'm fortunate in, in that I've taken to it quite well. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Chien, pour vous, pour tout. Chien, chien. <laughs> thank you, uh, Natalie. We'll take the next question from Christopher. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, I'm not a hello. psychotherapist and I don't have any, I'm an engineer actually, but I was drawn to this subject because I recently read a book by a chap who uh, has worked for 30 years in the virtual reality business. It's called The Great Simulation, uh, Rizwan Verk, and it was absolutely fascinating in the context of what we're seeing happening, particularly in America at the moment, where people... Mm for example the 6th of January events people seem to be psychologically affected and disturbed to an astonishing event um, extent based upon the fact that they seem to have spent 10 years experiencing ARGs alternative reality games it goes back to what James was saying and they're living in a form of partial separate reality which to me is actually quite frightening and i wondered if you professionals had any views on the on on the fact that they do seem to be uh mentally and psychologically making life decisions based upon the experiences they've had embedded for hours and hours day after day within these alternative reality games that's in addition to the point that this book was very convincing about the fact that we are probably living in some form of virtual reality and who the programmer is well that's open to question isn't it but but this mm -hmm. effect of arg seems quite shocking to me well the thing is what you're talking about and i think i've got a bit of an answer to um james's question here is that it's all very well being in a, uh, a reality that's not real, but it is delivered by our senses and our perceptions um, in a very equivalent and uh, similar way, so that we agree upon the reality we're in. When you start fragmenting that reality, when people start fragmenting reality into little personal or subgroups of their own perceptions and agreeing upon that, that's a human tendency. It makes for tribes, it makes for nations, doesn't it? But when you actually uh, fragment it so much in such a, a passionate and narrow way as happens in some of these Facebook groups and, and uh, other elements like that or, or gets facilitated by, by 
technology like that, then I think that's when it gets very tricky because we start losing. And we, and we were only all, all surviving here because we actually all agree that the sky is blue and the grass is green. If we start persuading in little subgroups that it's not and start actually battling the greeners against the redders, you know, where do we go? It's the worst form of tribalism. It's a very typically human activity, but we don't want to promote it, do we? And I think some of this online stuff promotes that tribalism of um, you know getting stuck in a certain perceptual point of view rather than agreeing more on okay this is our reality this is how we see it that's how i'd respond i think yes but thanks mm. I, I agree with mm. all that it's quite frightening mm. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it is the downside of what is otherwise a fantastic facility for communicating. Otherwise, how could we all meet and, and enjoy talking to each other? We'd never meet in our lifetimes without this. And so it's a great shame that, like most things, it can be so abused and, and you know, spoiled. Yeah. Mm. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I do agree. Like, we've talked about virtual reality, but augmented reality it complicates things much more because we're not adding a different layer of reality. We're modifying the reality we already have. So what, where does it or, stop? Yeah, or bits of it that we just want to privilege. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Problem. It definitely complicates things. So yes, thank you Chris, for that question. Uh, next thank question you. will come yeah. from uh, Peter. <laughs> oh yes, um, hello Chris. Thank you very much. Hi Peter. Oh, let me go and speak of you. Yeah, thank you very, very much for an extremely profound presentation. The great thank thing you. is that it will be recorded, so I'll be able to uh, watch it again and reread re the quotes from David Deutsch and Castro. Well, just um, one thing, um, last or year before last, I went to a one-week residential, well, young... Uh, run by um, a therapist, very good one. And it, the theme of the week was to develop our sensitivity. One of the exercises that we did, I suppose there were 20 of us, we stood in a circle, one stood in the middle, and you had to imagine um, something with a powerful emotion, some, something that had happened in your, your life. Well, I thought about the grief that I suffered when my wife had passed to the spirit world. So I focused on that, on grief. A woman directly behind me, with so no, no view of my face whatsoever, suddenly called out grief. So um, anyway, I just, so that is, um, I think, one very, very good example of transmission of emotions, feelings. Uh, well, that was at a distance. We couldn't even see each other. Of course. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, it happens all the time. It's just yeah. that in this day and age, we, we don't like to notice it because it's not meant to happen. We don't have the language or the scientific uh, corroboration for saying how these sort of things happen, but mm. they've always happened. And you know, we can be sensitive to them or ignore them or actually make the most of them. And maybe that is what is going on when you don't meet someone in a room. Maybe something else is going through the air. I don't know. It, it sounds daft when we start talking about it because we don't have the language for it anymore. No, with, and, with, sorry, with lots of the Zooms that I'm doing, some, yeah. um, I'm con I well believe convinced, plus my great interest in the whole of the the paranormal and the psychic world, sometimes it is possible, whether we call it telepathy or what, to have some influence or awareness of, of the actual speaker, some content in maybe that's Ooh. in their mind. I mean, I, I do accept that. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. And you, you're probably paying attention to your sensitivity of it. A a anyone could but we in general we don't and we're not encouraged to but you are doing it and good for you good for you in therapy we do it a little bit more than others maybe but there you are yeah you're taking it forward i'm glad thank you and thanks for that example that's great 
Yeah. Thank you, uh, Peter, for that. Uh, next question will come from Kevin. Great to see you, Kevin. Kevin. Great to, be, great to be here. Chris, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Hi. Okay, fantastic. Chris, I, I want to, to draw on your experience as, as an analyst and scholar. I'm thinking about silence and silence and managing silence in this kind of Zoom and, and online era. So silence in therapy itself is usually potentially very tricky to deal with, even when people are live in the room together. And obviously there are different schools of thought on how to approach silence. But I guess, have you found in your experience silence something more difficult to work with in this online setting? Because if I'm looking at myself now, it seems that the technology is forcing us to be silent to a certain extent. So if every one of us unmuted right now, you'd have this massive reverb, then there's something about the limitation of the technology. So I was just wondering if I could hear some of your thoughts about silence in this new setting and how you work with silence. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, what, one thing I, I perhaps don't prefer about Zoom and so on um, is that it rather privileges, um, because we're seeing head and shoulders, and mostly head, not the rest of the body, in this frame, it rather privileges looking directly at a person or trying to look at their eyes or looking at the camera as I'm doing now. So I look like I'm looking at you and I can't see you at all because you're down there. If I look at you, I'm not looking at your eyes. I don't like that. I think it rather uh, privileges this, this eye contact business, which in psychotherapy, as you know, you don't always have to have there. Um, you, even when you're face to face in psychotherapy, no one is really staring at each other in the eye. From time to time, you might want to make a point and grab eye contact. In other versions of therapy, which I also do, someone's on the couch. You don't look at them at all. They don't look at you. You're, you're in a shared space where there is something of the unconscious sh that you're both immersed in between you. You've got your conscious awareness and your conscious linguistic delivery, and then you're in something else. That's why psychotherapy is a, a, a special, different space. Now, you asked about silence. When you've got that space that isn't actually dominated by the visual, and despite what I said earlier, isn't dominated by language, though language brings things forth once you've realized them, there is space for something else to be coming up. And that's what happens in silence, whether you're together with someone successfully or easily, I think, when you're on Zoom with them, if it wasn't for us having to get over this rather over social and less psychological need to make strong eye contact or something like that. There's, in the silence, things definitely come up. And that's why I, I, I equally prefer no um, video on, on either side, because, you know, in those silences, I'm not worried. We're both there for our agreed time. And we're both in the same, presumably, in the same frame of mind to do some work, which is what we call psychotherapy. And so in those silences, what comes up, whether you want to turn it into a language form and communicate it or not, is an understanding, an insight. It might be a real weird memory in yourself as a therapist or in, in the client. And I'd like to hear from the client if they have a, a weird memory that seems out of context. If I have one, I might want to consider it. I might not want to say it, but it will inform me about what's going on between the two of us. And so silence speaks volumes, as they say. And you might not even know. You know yourself, each of you, but you not, might not always want to communicate it after you've had something come up in silence. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Is that any sort of answer? Yeah, Chris, that's absolutely fascinating. I don't want yeah. to usurp the conversation, but this idea of both having your cameras off and just having this space, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is this massive trust in the relationship and, and in that kind of container that you built in the first instance to be able to do that. But I'll, I'll, I'll stop it there. That's absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. You, you, you're right. You're right. That's got to be built up a little bit. Just because it's a psychotherapy session doesn't mean to say that trust is there from the get go. No, you're, you're right. It has to be built up in 
something called a psychotherapy session because that's what you've agreed on. That's your form uh, to build it up. Yeah, and it's possible to build it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Great question. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Kevin, for that. Yeah, that's a great question. And, mm. you know, at least in my experience of silence, silence on Zoom is very, gets uncomfortable, especially with a big group. In the same room, if everyone's silent, you can sort of feel the energies, as something that Natalie was saying, or was saying earlier, that everyone is in a proper silence, not an uncomfortable one. Or you can even sense if it's an uncomfortable one. But it even depends if on, yeah, it depends on the, the role of, well, it depends on having an attitude to silence in, in the sort of context you are. And if you're just in a committee room, it could certainly feel, you know, when you're d discussing committee things, it could certainly feel an awkward silence. But you could have an attitude to silence even there, um, saying, well, what's coming up in my silence is okay. And I'm listening to something, even though it's silent. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Just also interesting to compare this to film, because in film, you never have true silence. Where even in a silent scene, a, an editor will put, this the sound of silence which whether it's a slight hum so it's not that uncomfortable so that's what if we compare this to zoom for example where if you want to think about it it's really a video you're interacting with having true silence it, it's a new experience compared to film well the also is, is zoom. yeah it's go ahead. on uh, silent, I had a group for the first time this week and silence is also very different. It's easier if it's one-to-one, -one, but if it's a group, it's way harder. And I had difficulties to leave the silence in the group, especially we were meeting for the first time and it was very uncomfortable. Well, that's the first time, you know, that's, that goes about that business of trust, doesn't it? And, you know, no one would be expected to know what to do with silence, you know, unless you know, something has been built up for the group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wouldn't be even, even easier, I don't think, if you were in person, that one. No, no. Well, yeah. Mm. With the group, the group we, are, we therapists are not supposed to intervene too much. We want to let the energy, the group to yeah. own. Yeah. That's the space. Yeah. And it's easier when you meet face to face. It's harder when you do that in a group, mm. on a Zoom, mm. on a Zoom, virtually. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Just David, yeah. Sorry. Um, moving on, that was a great chat. Uh, we'll take the next question from David. Mm. Hi, David. Hey, hi, Chris. Um, hi. So I work, you know this, but others won't. I work as an executive coach and I have a colleague who there's a bit of a virtual reality conundrum. She operates very much in physical meta consciousness with her clients. But she knows someone who is deeply into consciousness as experience. So someone who suspends the five senses and experiences a much different form of reality. She will drop her an email to say, I'm feeling a bit blocked. Can you unblock me? She doesn't even know that it's happened. And when she's in with a client face to face, she notices a difference and a shift in what's happening live in the moment. So she sent an email, clear my chakras or whatever she's asked for. She um, doesn't know if it's happened. She's only sent it. This person who's in touch with consciousness as experience says they do what they do. She experiences a difference in the coaching relationship. Can I just get your view? What's going on there? You're asking me. Oh, I, I want everyone else's view. <laughs> We talk about this all the time, Dave. <laughs> I'd love to know what other people think is going on there, because, you know, do we have any language for what we think is going on there? You, you could say, like I said, well, there's no in there and out there. And so her out there and her in there, there's, there's no difference. It's, it's just, but how do you find that channel that overrides the apparent difference of that person being way over there and that person being there with their thoughts and so on and so forth we would just don't have the language for it what, what anyone got a clue what would you say how how do you start describing this peter might i don't know yeah if someone wants to come in well do, doing short work it, it has to do with the intent you're set. 
your intention connects the two, and, the, and if the connect if the intention is the same on both sides, it makes the connection very strong. If they're not if they're not on both sides fully, then you don't have the good connection, so you may not have any success in doing long distance healing. Well, that, that's a great way to start, but you know, if the connection is there, how is how is it working? I mean, what language have we got to describe how that intention is making that connection and making it work? How? Well, the way I I, I describe it is dropping the separation. The separation is in your in is in your awareness. The fact that we so when you set an intention to be connected with this person and not the rest of what he is, <clears throat> then that opens that channel. If you want to call it a channel, it's not, a, it, <laughs> that's where the language breaks down. But uh, dropping the separation that you hold with that person intentionally is what puts you in touch with them more because you've intentionally changed the boundary that you normally hold. Yeah, yeah. Is so a, that would require that would require a rather firm and concentrated state of mind to be able to drop yeah. that separation and have that degree of intention. And I think that's what we've heard that people can train themselves up to that level of intention and that level of concentration, perhaps. That's yeah. right. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, yeah. the person yeah. that's receiving the healing doesn't have to have the same level as the person. The, the most responsibility of of holding that intention is on the part of the person in the role of the shamanic practitioner, not mm -hmm. on the client. But the client has to drop this the separation that they hold to the extent that they're they're open to receiving what you are offering them. And that's why, that's why, that's one of the reasons why permission and understanding, you know, a, an informed permission is so important so that they understand what sorts of things you're gonna do, even though they don't understand it, except on a, on a ordinary level. Mm. And when you say drop the separation, that's the absolute key thing, because yeah. the idea of the separation is what keeps us in a position of resistance to That's seeing right. things in a different way and in a much more joined up way. And yeah. dropping the separation, that'd be lovely if we could all do that, but that needs practice, doesn't it? Well, I was taught that by a crippled fly. <laughs> by a what? Biggest teachers was a crippled fly. I was in a, I was in a workshop and trying to listen to the speaker and this fly kept buzzing, landing on my hand, making all kinds of noise and all that. And I was so, I, I was very distracted until I decided to see what was going on with the fly. And I discovered he was crippled as why he's making so much noise and flopping around so bad. But it, it, he taught me in that two or three minutes how to drop separation. And I felt it so strongly. I've been using that ever since. Fantastic. It's fantastic. You um, must have a Native American blood flowing through you or something. <laughs> um, um, one follow on, if I may, question for you, Chris. Um, yeah. So I, I, you and I have talked about this, but I, I work a little bit in the space of, you know, consciousness as experience. And so I use that with my clients virtually. So I do a lot of coaching mm. um, over Zoom or similar. And I noticed that when when you turn off the senses and uh, you work with your client, um, the impact of virtual reality makes the insights they get even stronger than if you were there in person, because they think you might be influencing them by your person. But because you're removed and they have a really strong effect, I notice it's, there's actually an acceleration in their development. And I wonder what your thoughts were on that. And also, doesn't that mean we should include consciousness as experience in the training of analysts and therapists? Mm. Well, absolutely for that second part. And that's my problem with some of the 
way that these ideas and thoughts from Jung are used in training in that they are rather they get rather watered down and they're not regarded as impactful and as powerful implications as they are for our sense of what's going on between us and what we perceive as reality and therefore between us ourselves as two you know real assumed real organisms who are separate in space now going back to what you said that's very interesting that there there, 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 there might be a less resistance because you are not in the room as as the client and so they are actually we could say unguarded you could say they're they're more open to actually receiving something and transmitting something and frankly that's another way of describing what i would say i've experienced with people um, all, all I can say definitely is it's no less so than if I'm with them in person, but you know, you're actually saying it's sometimes better and more so and stronger than being with them in person because the resistance that comes about from two bodily people being together is, is absent. And I, I, I'd, I'd say that's true. I'd say that's true. I'd like to do, well, no, I don't want to talk to therapists about this because I think they're all biased, but I was going to say I'd like to do a survey. But <laughs> I'd like to do a survey with regular people and, and see if they find that with their experience of Zoom in COVID times. It'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, David, for sparking that great uh, conversation. Um, as we only have two minutes, maybe we should start closing the session. Uh, Chris, do you have any yes. final remarks? No, I, I don't. I, on the one hand, I think my, my I, I'm glad it's recorded because my paper is very dense and I, I although the, the last bit about film was shortish, the other two are very heavy sandwiches to take in one go. <laughs> James is nodding like that. So, you know, take it slowly, read Deutsch's book um, and have a look at what I say and, and see what makes sense to you. And I, I thank you. And I, I feel our conversation is exactly what I would have wanted. It's broadened out from the details of the way I approach things here. But we kept hold of computers. We kept hold of uh, therapy and silence and being together or being separate. Um, all these are the important things to talk about because we're still here. We, it still looks like reality. And, you know, we've got to get on with it. So that's all I'll say. Well, thank you very much for your questions. Thank you, uh, Chris. Thank you, Chris, for that amazing presentation, amazing discussion. Thank you for all for joining us. Thank you. It's thank been great. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Just before you all go, I just wanted to invite you to our next event here at the Pari Center, uh, which is Beyond Bone, Science, Order and Creativity. Uh, this series will focus mostly on looking at the aspects of David Bohm's work will have in the future, all the implication of his ideas. The event is divided in two parts. Uh, the first actually starts next week, uh, which will, the first part will focus more on Bohm's physics and science and we'll have a subtitle, Physics and Metaphysics. The speaker for this event include Emily Adlam, Basil Haile, Pavel Pilkanen, Giuseppe Vitiello, and all shared by Shantina Sabadini, our director. Uh, the second part will take place in August and we'll look more at Bohm's philosophy and thought. And the subtitle is Contemplation and Creativity. Uh, the second part will not have a single speaker per session, will be more of a series of panel discussions. All these panel discussions will have a nucleus, we're calling them, a sort of a head panelist. And these panelists will be Hester Reeves, Lee Nichol, Leroy Littlebear, Dave Schramm, and Beth Macy. And the whole event has been chaired by Lee Nichol. If you want to know more on these, uh, go on our website or you can confess, uh, contact us directly. Um, you can contact us through social media, uh, Sutra, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc., or send us an email at uh, james at parisenter.com to contact me or eleanor at parisenter.com to contact eleanor. Thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you again soon here at the Paris Center. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, everyone. Bye. And now we can go back to reality. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs>